Theory, a think tank advancing reason, science, and secular values in public affairs and at the grassroots. Hector Avalos serves as professor of religious studies at Iowa State University. Once upon a time, he was a Pentecostal preacher and a child evangelist. Since then, he has earned a Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology from the University of Arizona in 1982, a Master's of Theological Studies from Harvard Divinity School in 1985, and the Ph.D. degree in Hebrew Bible and Near Eastern Studies from Harvard University, 1991. His many books include Illness and Health Care in the Ancient Near East, Biblical Crime, Fighting Words, The Origins of Religious Violence, and The End of Biblical Studies. Welcome to Point of Inquiry, Hector Avalos. Well, thank you very much, Bob, for having me on the show. Hector, you've um, generated a storm of controversy with your book, The End of Biblical Studies. It sounds real apocalyptic. Uh, in what sense has the end come for biblical studies? The title is actually a double entendre. It's meant in two senses. One is biblical studies has ended, or it's a plea to end biblical studies as we know it. The other sense is and in the terms of purpose. So the end is the purpose of biblical studies. And sometimes people don't uh, understand that double meaning, but the end of biblical studies has come in the sense that there's really no new data uh, with which to work, and people are simply recycling old arguments, and uh, nothing new has come of major areas. Uh, the Bible is an ancient document, and... Uh, all of the people that are working on it, or most of them, still have a lot of religionist assumptions. And so in that sense, also, it's a plea that this type of biblical study should end, that we should move to a completely secular uh, view of the field. Uh, would it be like um, a classical study of the Iliad and the Odyssey? That's right. So we don't uh, privilege the Iliad and the Odyssey uh, in our uh, modern culture in terms of we don't use it as an authoritative text to decide on policy or to live our lives. We study it as a relic of the ancient world. And whatever lessons it, it, it might have, uh, it really doesn't carry much weight in terms of uh, trying to enact legal policies on, on its basis, as we do with sometimes with the Bible. Can you imagine uh, <laughs> devotional studies such as we have on the Bible uh, <laughs> done from the Iliad and the Odyssey? I know the Stoics did stuff like that and tried to allegorize it, but I can just imagine the the, the uh, sermons. Like if, if a goddess appears to you and asks you to uh, uh, host the Miss America contest, for God's sake, don't do it. Uh, uh, but... Uh, uh, it's uh, it's just amazing the stuff they try to do with the Bible, and I wonder if if any of the same if classicists would ever think of doing any of that with something like Beowulf or the Iliad and the Odyssey or whatever, um, like disability studies in uh, in the uh, in the Iliad or uh, uh, parenting in the case of Grendel in uh, in uh, Beowulf or something. It's just, it's just unbelievable the ways in which the Bible becomes a ventriloquist dummy just to keep the thing alive. I should say. Uh, yes. And, and if, if you go to meetings of professional societies of classics, I never see a devotional service to Zeus or a prayer to Zeus uh, as we do, say, in the side of biblical literature, uh, where some affiliate organizations and, and even some units uh, may be a little more devotional uh, than anything you would ever see uh, in a meeting of a professional organization of the classics or uh, English literature. There are actually opening prayers and the like at some uh, functions of the uh, Society for Biblical Literature? Uh, yes, at least some affiliate societies. Uh, the Evangelical Theological uh, Society, for example, has it on the program. You know. Wow. I, I guess that shouldn't surprise me. Uh, 
Bob Funk uh, always took credit, uh, he and a few others, for opening the doors of the SBL so that it would no longer be an exclusive ivory tower. But uh, I hate to put it this way, but it's almost like he just opened the gates for the barbarians to plunge in. Uh, it's uh, it's like it's 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 so open minded. It's, it's got to be closed for repairs, as the uh, as the thing goes. Uh, do do you notice? Uh, I, this has been my sense, but I, I couldn't prove it. Do you notice a demographic shift in terms of who, um, which churches send more people to seminaries and which seminaries are um, viable with a lot of students and, and start sending these students to the SBL? And, and we, as a result, we have a demographic shift of uh, conservative evangelicals controlling the uh, the the um, the meetings and what is considered relevant and what is considered methodologically legitimate is or is that just my imagination is the whole thing going conservative or or not yeah it it um, impressionistically one can say that i don't have any hard statistical data to tell you which denominations are represented which uh, uh, churches which seminaries are mostly uh, represented here or there uh, what I can say is that some of what goes on uh, at the Society of Biblical Literature would not be acceptable in any other organization that deems itself to be a professional historical organization. Uh, any, any sort of theological reasoning would not be acceptable. Any sort of devotional service to other gods would, would not be acceptable, certainly. And... Yes, in general, the end of biblical studies, the book, argues that the study of biblical literature and most of what is called biblical studies today is still part of an ecclesial academic complex that church and ecclesiastical sorts of agendas still control a lot of what goes on. So even if uh, people are calling themselves uh, followers of the historical critical method, uh, in, in essence, most of what I see is still a type of apologetics that tries to privilege this book at the expense of many other books in antiquity that have just as much wisdom or more, are, are just as beautiful or more uh, than, than the Bible. And it's a way to then, uh, in essence, to protect the, the employment of these scholars, uh, in which today in, in uh, most uh, biblical uh, scholars, um, if you look at the ads on uh, the website of the American Academy of Religion or the site of biblical literature, are really in seminaries. There are very few positions open now in what, what I would call public institutions, you know, uh, state universities, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, mostly now uh, the profession exists in theological seminaries of one sort or another. Yet, yeah, ironically, I'm sure a lot of the supporters of those seminaries, once they get wind of some of the things being taught there, uh, are thinking, wait a minute, th these guys are secularists. They're not true believers. We had that happen at Drew, uh, where, uh, hey, why doesn't Professor so-and-so preach in chapel? Uh, you know, but he's not really a believer. It's uh, you're, you're really, like, uh, open to, um, you're in the line of fire on both sides with that but uh, it's uh, it's uh, a funny thing. Like if if you're you got one foot in the academy, and so the the church is suspicious of you, but you got uh, one foot in the church, so the academy is rightly suspicious. Uh, right. I don't envy those people. Uh, do you think that? Well, you know, that is something occurs to me that never did before. There is an odd parallel between this re-spiritualizing um, or retrenchment in the SBL and the same sort of thing in the Jesus Seminar, because um, after they finished the uh, initial eleven years of scrutiny of the gospel tradition, they were trying to decide what to do next, and Bob Funk and others were making it explicitly a kind of a liberal theology think tank that they wanted to 
reform Christianity for the new millennium and uh, Bishop Spong and um, Karen Armstrong and others got in and there was a division because a lot of people like Bob Miller uh, said, no, wait a minute, wait, wait a minute, we signed on here to be historians. We've always disclaimed any sort of religious agenda here, but now you're making our critics right. And uh, then so they... they um, I don't know if it was because uh, Bob passed passed away, but they they now have kind of, as far as I know, gone back to the pure history. Uh, but it's it's very odd. Uh, secular critics like us uh, feel less at home. Should we start some other alternative organization to uh, pursue our agenda, or or is there such a thing somewhere already? Yeah, it, it, it it's hard to say what. The next step should be, uh, one of the things we have done is try to see if we can start a unit within the SBL that would be devoted explicitly to secular um, themes and, and methods. And we've only been mildly successful, and I say that because uh, this year, for example, the SBL highlighted one of our sessions, which was explicitly about secular approaches uh, in, in its program. So it's called a highlight session. Uh, but on the other hand, our unit, uh, we proposed a new unit called Secular Biblical Criticism, and it has been delayed quite a long time now uh, since we proposed it. And so I'm not sure uh, whether it will be approved or not. The problem comes in, comes in numbers. How many explicitly secular scholars are there? It's hard to get those numbers. And could we form a, a sustaining organization with our own conventions and that sort of thing? And so it, it, it's going to be very difficult to, to know. But one way is to start within the SBL and see how many people you attract within the organization. Uh, and if you don't attract enough within the SBL, it's hard to know where those people are going to come from since uh, most people that uh, – do biblical studies, whether they're secular or not, usually belong or have belonged to the SBL at some point. Mm -hmm. It's a funny thing to know. Like, I would think some of the people around Bert and Mac and some working group or committee, or I can't keep these things straight, uh, he had this thing about reconceiving Christian origins. I don't know if it's still going on, but I cannot imagine that someone like uh, Mac uh, would uh, have any problem being identified as a secular uh, critic. And... Um, and and others who you would think would be are not like uh, Elizabeth Schussler Fiorenza, a uh, great great uh, feminist uh, biblical scholar who was at our uh, meeting there for ideological criticism. You can you can find her saying astonishing things like uh, she'll she'll criticize some chauvinistic passage in the Bible and say now this is not the word of God, implying that some of the rest of it is. And I think right. to myself, lady, don't you get it? There isn't any word of God? How can you... <laughs> yes, and, and also um, her, her defense of miracles was somewhat, somewhat uh, surprising to me. I had never heard her uh, defend uh, miracles as, as strongly as she has, in, in, at least in the writings I've, I've read. Um, so that, that was kind of surprising, but it, again, shows you how most of the top biblical scholars in the SBL are still part of this ecclesial academic complex. And it, it, there are a few of us that are trying to make it, again, uh, very secular. The problem is that a lot of the people that are in the SBL think they are secular. They actually think they're doing secular biblical studies when they're not. So you have to kind of convince them that they're still religionists before they can uh, come over to your side a bit more, and maybe they don't want to after that, you know. Boy, I got a lot to learn. Uh, it's uh, the uh, the biblical studies community is at least as filled with mysteries as the Bible itself, I'm telling you. Do you think the future focus of biblical studies ought to be a kind of anti-apologetics demonstrating the Bible isn't the word of God and that people don't need to worry about it anymore? Or, or is that still too f focused, albeit 
uh, negatively on the traditional thing. Like, what what sort of thing do you think biblical studies ought to be in in secular hands? What should we be trying to show about it or learn about it? I think that you know there's um, two or, or three tracks that one should follow, but but one of them certainly is to do the purely historicist kinds of things that any one in say classical studies would do, uh, without any interest in whether Seuss did this or that uh, for real, or whether Seuss still speaks to us. It's purely historical. The other track, uh, which is necessary only because the Bible has been privileged to such uh, an enormous extent, is to undermine biblical authority in the modern world. That is, an, an activist stance towards that. And not all secular scholars uh, would want to do that or think we should do that. But I, for one, uh, do believe that um, deprivileging biblical authority so that it is at least even with all the other books of antiquity should be something we should actively uh, be doing. And yes, fighting apologists, fighting uh, those on the other side, for example, in the evangelical theological study should be something we should be championing constantly uh, because uh, they actually have more outlets uh, for their uh, for their ideas and for the information that people get than, than the secularists do. It, it's only recently that uh, you have had some best-selling secularist political scholars uh, like Bart Ehrman you'll go to the top of the New York Times bestseller list. But uh, by and large, we, we need more Bart Ehrmans. We need many more, and, uh, and, and, and some more activists even than Bart Ehrman. You know, there, there's a strange case to me, because uh, he's done one book, I think, very highly of uh, the orthodox corruption of Scripture, but most of his assumptions are still so conditioned by a conservative view. He strikes me almost as an apologist for a faith he doesn't hold anymore. <laughs> yeah, I pointed out how the uh, in the interbiblical studies how some of this some of the statements about how many manuscripts we had uh, and how that speaks well for somehow the the faithfulness of the biblical record uh, is something I didn't expect in the newest edition where he's listed as a a co-author, you know. I expected that from Metzger, maybe. But I expected that argument to have uh, gone away, and it it didn't in the new edition. So so I'm I'm not so sure what's going on there, but I would say that he's gone farther than any, in, in terms of selling books, farther than I thought anyone that had those ideas would go, uh, because he does take on uh, the Odyssey and, and, and biblical justice uh, quite strongly, I thought. Yeah, I guess there he's sort of picking up on some of the same vibes as the new atheists. Right. It's kind of a marketplace where you can say stuff like that. And I think that the fact that that's what drove him out of faith and, and it wasn't any kind of skepticism about Christian origins. Uh, that sort of left him open to continue to hold, like, to the magic number seven of Pauline epistles and, right. and, uh, and all that sort of thing. He's, he's an uh, interesting uh, case. Yeah, I think ethics is where apologetics is the most vulnerable right now. And you can see in Christian apologetics even a shift. So that even a few years ago, or even 10, 15 years ago, Christian conservative apologists were defending the historicity of, say, Joshua. And now because of the implications of all the genocide in Joshua and the the fact that many new atheists are pointing out that biblical ethics are uh, probably the worst thing about uh, the Bible, uh, they're, they're now shying away from the historicity of Joshua and saying, well, those aren't really, those events didn't really happen. And so... You, the genocide is not really, you know, actual. It's it's more idealized, and 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 so that's a new way to undermine the historicity, which you didn't expect from conservatives. You know, it's because of the ethics that they fear the historicity now. 
That is interesting to hear. I, I wasn't. I, I'm not really tuned into what they're saying about the Old Testament much, but I have said in class uh, for years that uh, it, to conservative students, if you're disturbed by the uh, the fact that um, it appears these things didn't really happen, look, you, you're getting rid of a major headache here. This is the worst thing about the Bible. You can get rid of it now, uh, and I guess some of them are finally doing that. Yeah. Well, well if you read. The for example, the commentary on Joshua by Richard Hess, among others, uh, you can see the shift, you know, where historicity uh, is not as important as defending the ethics of the Bible. Ethics is, defending the ethics of the Bible is superseding defending the historicity of the Bible now, whereas before it was really the historicity of the Bible. The ethics were not so much of a problem, you know. You can see where that's headed. Uh, you know, this, eventually they're going to be demythologizing. Uh, it's they're they're right when they say you you uh, like the camel's nose is under the tent there because what can you not allegorize or demythologize to get rid of the problems and uh, it's going to be interesting to see what they do. Well, if you look at the Encyclopedia Bible of Diphrocles by uh, Gleason Archer, a uh, very famous Christian apologist, uh, he had no problem with the genocide, you know, in the uh, Pentateuch or in Joshua and and other books, but the more modern apologists do. And so you can see it even in the last 20, 25 years, that shift. Well, William Lane Craig hasn't got on that train yet because he actually made some unbelievable statement that uh, since the infants being butchered in uh, Joshua uh, are uh, going immediately to heaven uh, and and the adults deserved it, the people we really ought to be uh, sorry for, the poor Israelite um, soldiers who had to kill babies. <laughs> you, you are insane. Yes, and I have written on that. I, I have an essay called Creationists for Genocide um, that I published uh, on a uh, website called Talk Origins. And uh, I point out that that's a great argument for abortion, you know, uh, because if that's true, then abortion pr provides a 100% salvation rate. So you should be for abortion, not against it. Though if, if Calvin was right, uh, those reprobate babies are going to fry anyway, right? What do you call them? <laughs> Little serpents in the crib. Uh, incredible. <laughs> Uh, what do you think, speaking of all the uh, fascinating Old Testament changes, what do you think of Old Testament minimalism? Uh, do you think Moses existed or David or Solomon? Was there ever a temple of Solomon, etc.? Well, I have to begin with uh, what people mean by minimalism. Uh, I define myself as a minimalist in the sense that I would only accept as historical what has some sort of independent uh, corroboration. So um, by that standard, very few things in the Old Testament can be called historically established. And in that sense, I'm a minimalist. Um, so no, I don't think there's any evidence uh, at the moment for, say, the existence of Abraham or, or Solomon or most of the figures mentioned in Genesis. We have no independent evidence for their existence or for many of the events, uh, major events we have no independent evidence for, for their occurrence. So I'm a minimalist in that sense. I think there are very few things, uh, even in the New Testament, that we can say actually occurred on the basis of independent corroboration. And, and so I'm a minimalist in that sense, and I think people should be proud of being a minimalist. Not, it shouldn't be a, uh, a bad word. Well, uh, how about the archaeology of it? Doesn't the, the lack of evidence of the temple or the exodus or uh, a great royal Jerusalem in David's time, doesn't that kind of just eliminate the possibility even that, that these things were historically true? Well, I don't like to say eliminate the possibility, but I would say definitely there is no evidence where you'd expect it to be. After all, uh, the Solomonic kingdom is, is described as... as, as spanning from uh, Egypt all the way to Iraq in today's geography. Yet, we find no letters going to and from Solomon. We find uh, no economic relations being reported with this great kingdom. So that's not something we usually see with kingdoms of that size elsewhere in the Near East. You know, there's some trace uh, of them. So I'd be prepared to say, 
it's not likely that at least the Solomonic Empire of the size described or as as uh, as glorious as, as it is described in the Bible probably did not exist, that it's probably a fiction. Uh, whether there was a Solomon individual named Solomon or not, I, I'm an agnostic. Hmm. Uh, it's amazing to me. I, I uh, used to be a fundamentalist uh, and went along with the old-time religion of Wellhausen and Kunin. Uh, and now I find that these guys were <laughs> just almost uh, hopelessly optimistic in terms of uh, what they thought happened. Like uh, Wellhausen says that there was no tabernacle, that that's a retrojection of Solomon's temple into the wilderness period. But now it looks like there wasn't any Solomon's temple. That must have been a retrojection of uh, Zerubbabel's temple, and holy mackerel, have I got a headache. Yeah, it, it, it's hard to say, you know, uh, some of the work going on right now, the, you know, they're by Mazar, things they might find something, but it, it's hard to say, so I remain an agnostic on that. Is it ever going to be possible to get past these scandals of faked relics and evidence? Uh, it's almost impossible to tell whether there's any evidence of uh, David. And uh... Yeah, one of the pomegranates that was used uh, as evidence for the existence of Solomon's Temple has, has been <clears throat> declared a forgery, at least by some. Um, and so it, it is very difficult to say what should be taken as, as an authentic piece of evidence now because of so many scandals uh, and so many things that come from the black market. I try to, whenever I try to reconstruct a history of ancient Israel, I try to just restrict myself to things that have been excavated. And But unfortunately, it's very difficult. You know, most of the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, or a lot of them, came in, you know, from the Bedouins. And... Uh, Hmm. So it, it, it's hard to say what is authentic and what isn't sometimes. Uh, it's true. And so people have to be cautious all the time, especially of, of things that were not extracted from actual excavations and under archaeological supervision. Hmm. Uh are you familiar with Rene Salm, if I'm yeah. pronouncing that right? His work suggesting that there just wasn't an inhabited Nazareth during the ostensible time of Jesus. What do you think of that? It's hard to say. I, I'm an agnostic about that, too. Uh, the problem still is that most of our actual sources don't date to the first century, uh, even, even the New Testament sources, because I start with actual hard copies, you know, uh, if you look at the earliest source in the New Testament, it's P52, which is just a little bit of text from the second century. We we don't get anything really until the third and fourth centuries. So we have no way to know what, what was changed or not changed between uh, the first century and the time the extant manuscripts uh, we have uh, were, were, were copied. And sometimes people will point to Josephus and Tacitus and all that, but... The, the truth is, the works of those people, uh, the, the earliest manuscripts we have, are sometimes from the Middle Ages. So, so it's hard to know, you know, what Christians have interpolated or not into those manuscripts. So, when it comes to sources from the first century, we actually uh, have a poverty of sources. We, I, I can't tell you uh, much of anything about the first century, and. Uh, archaeologically, it, it's very difficult to to determine anything about Jesus. Uh, there are no documents from his time. So there's a lot of people, of course, trying to say, well, the, the Gospels were composed in the first century. and But the actual manuscripts of those Gospels don't come from the first century. We don't know what has been changed at all. Uh, John Baverslos put this well in a manuscript, I don't think it's seen publication yet, where he says all of this stuff, like you mentioned before, the huge number of uh, manuscript copies of the Gospels, uh, we can weed out the errors, and we've got just 97% uh, certainty that it's just like the original. And he says, look, this is like claiming I got a million pictures of my aunt, but I have never seen my aunt, so uh, short of that, how 
can I possibly be sure these these things are 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 accurate? I mean, they might be, but <laughs> <laughs> it's all circular. Uh, that's right. I mean, we, unless you have the original, you don't know how much any manuscript agrees with the original. So it, saying that you know any manuscript is ninety eight percent certain is impossible without the original. You know, you you wouldn't know. Mm. But, of course, the hidden assumption is God wouldn't have allowed it to change much. Uh, the only person I ever heard say that, I know there's an extreme group of apologists, uh, the preservationists, that say that uh, you can find the uh, original of every reading somewhere in the tradition, but God's playing a kind of game of hide-and-seek. But uh, with a similar thing about the Jesus tradition, it must be accurate. George Eldon Ladd, uh, the dean of Evangelical New Testament scholars, he was the only one I know of who ever admitted, look, form criticism could go any way, either way, uh, any time, but uh, we believe the Holy Spirit could have kept it uh, uh, accurate, so that's our working assumption. Well, at least he admitted it. He, he's not doing rigorous methodological criticism. The others have the same assumption. They just don't admit it. Well, are are you agnostic about whether Jesus existed? Yes, I am. I, I don't know anything really about Jesus. I all I have are reports from second, third, and fourth century manuscripts about this this person, this figure. I, I don't know mm. much about him at all uh, that I can say is established by independent uh, evidence of some sort, which is my test of historicity, at least one of them. So yes, I'm an agnostic as to the historical Jesus. I don't know much about him. Yeah, if, if, if there was, a, I like to say, if there ever was a historical Jesus, there isn't any more. There's just no way to know. Uh, uh, you've also written on biblical crime, a fascinating uh, topic. Uh, can we use the lists of what was prohibited in the in various parts of the Bible to reconstruct what the prevalent crimes were, or are they uh, just artificial lists of? Uh... Well, it, it, it's hard to, to know. I thought, you know, if you if you go by the Ten Commandments, certainly we expect murder and killing uh, to have existed. We expect robbery to have existed. Those are things that uh, exist in most cultures. Uh, anyway, so prohibitions against that would not be surprising. Uh, some of the other things, uh, bestiality, and, and you know, we, we have very little evidence as to the uh, extent of it or uh, the the incidence of it uh, in those ancient cultures. So it's it's hard to know. Um, so some some people have done studies of actual lawsuit documents and noted that very seldom are say that laws of Hammurabi quoted or in we have a lot of divorce decrees and proceedings from Elephantini, a Jewish colony. And very seldom are, you know, the, the Ten Commandments or even the Bible quoted for any particular action. So it's hard to know and plus having a temple at Elephantini, a Jewish temple, would have violated a great uh, central tenet of Deuteronomy. And so, yeah, yeah. so we we know that uh, either they didn't know about this, or they didn't care. This thing in Joshua, where uh, they the tribes, uh, what is it? Uh, not Ephraim and. I can't think of what, uh, which ones they were now, but they, they stayed outside of the Holy Land proper because they liked the, the territory there and built a, a temple of their own and then nearly got uh, destroyed for it when everybody else mobilized. And they said, oh, this is just a museum piece. It's not the real thing. Does that reflect something like these colonies, these temples in, uh, in Egypt and so on? Or could the stories be that late? It's hard to know because... A lot of scholars think that this idea of centralization, that is, that you should only have one temple, came about maybe at the time of Hezekiah and, and the crisis surrounding the impending attack on Jerusalem by the Assyrians. And so the idea is he tried to consolidate everything in that one city so that it wouldn't be attacked, uh, in out, the outlying areas wouldn't be attacked, you know. And so the idea was bring everything into 
Jerusalem, uh, including all of the treasures of any temples outside of Jerusalem, and we can protect them better here. And so, but 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 it's hard to say what the idea was in centralization, other than the keepers of the main temple wanted to hog all the resources for themselves, you know. And so it's kind of a power grab in some constructions of what happened there. Wow. Were the Ten Commandments ever an actual code of laws, like I, I gather the Sharia would be in, in Islamic societies, or, or is it more like a, a, an ideal utopia sort of a thing, or Plato's Republic? Were, were they ever actually in force? Well, like I said, we, we do have a lot of uh, divorce proceedings and that sort of thing from some Jewish communities, say, in the uh, already maybe by the uh, second half of the first millennium BCE, and very few cite anything that would say, well, I'm doing this because, you know, Deuteronomy says so or because uh, Leviticus says so. Uh, we do have some indication of that in the Dead Sea Scrolls where in that community, which we think we can date better, uh, you know, second century and on, uh, to about just before 70 C, uh, they, they were uh, applying a lot of those uh, laws. I mean, they had biblical manuscripts. For example, the laws about who can come into the temple and can come into the city if you had some sort of uh, skin disease. Uh, you, you're not let in. So we know that the Dead Sea Scrolls community uh, was was applying that. But but outside of that, uh, in the more general populace, we don't know. We have very little evidence. And they might not because the Qumran people are like uh, Hasidic Jews in Williamsburg or something. That's uh, they're, they're an intentional, pious community uh, that uh, that has withdrawn because the larger society is not good enough for right. them. Yeah. So it, it's hard to say they were representative of all the Jews that lived at that time. Uh, even in ancient Israel, uh, saying, I guess it's even harder to know uh, in that yes, case. We, we have really nothing, you know, before... Before the Dead Sea Scrolls, we really don't have any very much independent evidence of what's going on in Israel in terms of the application of the Ten Commandments. There are very few inscriptions that we do have, and, and those that we do have don't talk very much about those subjects. Who, if anyone, enforced the law in ancient Israel and Judah and, and similar societies? Did they have police forces, or was it the army? I, I just suddenly realized this fundamental thing I, I know nothing about. Yeah, it seems as though... Um, from what we can tell from ancient Near Eastern practice, either there were local elders who would do that, sort of like when a, what goes on in Afghanistan, you know, where the village has elders, and they they do the enforcing of the laws. So they get together and uh, say a woman has committed some act of sexual impropriety in their eyes. Uh, the elders would, would handle that. And it says that also in Deuteronomy, uh, in many parts, you know, the elders are to do this or that. Uh, sometimes the king would enact justice. So there are a number of people mentioned in the Hebrew Bible as the, the executors of justice. But by and large, at the village level, and most people I've lived in small villages, not in Jerusalem or something of that size, were probably the elders. Hmm. Fascinating. Wow. Uh now, I think you're, you're beginning to put your end of biblical studies uh, thesis in real danger here because you're showing how you can find out interesting new stuff from the same old evidence. I mean, you really got an eagle eye there. Well, yes, but, but only, in other words, um, what I'm saying is if you end the religionist way you study, you can. So my plea to end biblical studies is, it's, it's to end biblical study as we know it, which is a, as a religionist enterprise. And I'm saying if you, so it's not a call to ban biblical studies itself, but the way it's done. And a lot of people sometimes misunderstand it. You know, they think I'm trying to ban the Bible or trying to ban the study of the Bible. No, I'm trying to end the way it's studied. And you, you can, there's no new data. You can, you can pose new questions, though, once you, get away from this religionist mindset, but it's not going to uncover new new history without new data. It's just that you ask new questions of the data you have. 
Well, I got to finish up with something really out of left field, but I know you've dealt with things like this, uh, and I just uh, because this has come up on my Bible Geek podcast recently, I want to ask somebody more authoritative than me. You know, the, there's this whole <laughs> alternate interpretation of the Bible from the the quarter of of the UFO people and the flying saucer groups and all that and you've done some really terrific things uh showing up the the strange ironies of how they use the bible this one book i read this oh decades ago but i remember this book the spaceships of ezekiel this guy who was a nasa engineer with no interest in this was asked to look at this thing where ezekiel in the first couple of chapters sees the throne chariot of God and all these weird things with rotating wings and all that. He said, son of a gun, this does look like a primitive description of a viable flying vehicle. Uh, And uh, so he wound up saying, I don't know what to make of it, but what do you think of that? What is the best explanation you know of for this strange thing described by Ezekiel? Does it fit Babylonian iconography or what do we know about that? Um, yes, it does. That's that's exactly what many scholars think it is. That uh, what you find in Ezekiel, for example, the composite creatures. Uh, those are not odd. If you look around, say, any Mesopotamian city, all cities, uh, the great ones, would be filled with creatures that were composite. And at the same time, they had many stories of or. Uh, the ideas of, 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 of a throne of God that was that, that could do all sorts of things. And Yahweh, the Hebrew God, was probably a storm god. That's one of his main characteristics. And storm gods ride the clouds. And, and in fact, we know that one of the specific epithets of Yahweh, the cloud rider, is found in at a place called Ugarit, in, which is north of modern Israel. And there we found these tablets that describe a lot of the things that are said about the biblical God are said about the gods there. So the the rider of the clouds, uh, storm gods ride chariots, you know, in the air. And you can see it even uh, in Teutonic myth where where Thor, you know, rides a chariot. So so it, it was a characteristic of storm gods to ride these uh, flying uh, either chariots or, or if you call them thrones, that's maybe another way to visualize it. But, but those flying objects were characteristics of storm gods whose um, main appearance was, was basically clouds and, and storm clouds. So, yes, they're going to be in the air. They're going to be up. They come at you in a way that's conceptualized very differently than what we do today. You know, today... When we see a thunderstorm coming, we say, there's a thunderstorm coming. In the ancient world, in the ancient Israel, when the Israelites saw a thunderstorm coming, they said, here's Yahweh coming, and he's in the air. You know, all the lightning, the thunder, his voice, uh, the light is him in the clouds. So that's why they they would visualize a thundercloud with with a bright lightning. And sometimes if you look at night, you know, the, the strobe effect of those is what I think is being visualized in Ezekiel. So they're, they're basically visualizing a thunderstorm and then injecting more imaginative explanations for that thunderstorm uh, as Yahweh being in the cloud. You know. Fascinating. Well, speaking of weird questions, I've read books where people say that there's a lot of hallucinogenic drug use in the Bible and that the manna, what do you make of that whole shebang? Uh, I don't find very much independent evidence for that. I mean, uh, uh, there was a, um, a scholar named John Allegro who was an original member of the Dead Sea Scrolls that, you know, uh, popularized the idea of of mushrooms as uh, one of the main things of early Christianity. That's why they saw all these things. But by and large, I don't see much independent evidence. I think it's the work of the imagination. That's all you need. And uh, like I said, if, if you were living... At that time, these kinds of creatures and uh, uh, themes would not be odd at all. That's what they were seeing all the time. You know, look at the Sphinx in Egypt. Uh, 
look at the creatures they have in Mesopotamia. It's just mm. normal. It wasn't odd. It's, and it's part of the artistic imagination to me. You know, we, we, when we look at a Dali painting, we'll say, whoa, look at those. Uh, do those ever exist? You know, those, those composite creatures he has, uh, those watches that are melting on, 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 on tree branches. Where, where, where does that come from? Well, it's, it's from the imagination. They don't exist in real time and space. Though I did see one in a catalog the other day, but I think that's probably uh, getting the cart before the horse. Yeah, so asking those questions, like, you know, who, who is the real Superman? <laughs> you know, what is kryptonite, you know? Well, those are just, those are the products of the imagination. There is no, no referent, uh, no real referent behind that, you know. You're not going to find Superman uh, or traces of Superman in the real world because he, he's not there, you know. Yeah, what a disappointment, too. <laughs> well, that would be great. Well, I, you're really a, a superman among Bible scholars, I'm telling you. I mean, just all sorts of interesting information about a wide range of things. I, I've learned something here, and I know uh, our uh, listeners have, too. Hector, I, I really appreciate you being on the, the show, and I hope, I hope I can have you back again sometime. Well, thank you very much, Bob, and I appreciate all the work you have done in uh trying to advance the cause of uh, secular biblical studies. Uh, well, we've got to be yoke fellows in the great cause. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks again. See you again soon. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Point of Inquiry. To get involved with an online conversation about today's show, Join the online discussion forum at pointofinquiry.org. Views expressed on Point of Inquiry aren't necessarily the views of the Center for Inquiry, nor its affiliated organizations. Questions and comments on today's show can be sent to feedback at pointofinquiry.org. Point of Inquiry is produced by Adam Isaac in Amherst, New York, and our music is composed for us by Emmy Award winner Michael Whalen. Today's show also featured contributions from Debbie Goddard. I'm your host, Robert Price. <laughs>